Hi, everyone. Let's get me nice and bright here. Hello. Welcome to my YouTube live at five Pacific Standard Time, where you can ask me all of your questions. Live at five today. Come on in. I'm going to put on some chapstick and stuff while I wait for some people. Come on in, guys. Welcome, welcome. Hey, Michelle. Welcome. Hey, Priscilla. Hey, Megan. Hey, guys. Hey, Constance. Generically awesome. <laughs> I love that. Amy, thank you for being here and thank you for being there. Welcome everyone. Hospice Nurse Julie here. Live at five every Wednesday. Come on in. Just getting my lips on, as my mom would say. Welcome everyone. Yeah, don't forget to tap the heart, Megan says. Hi, Sandra. Welcome everybody. Come on in. Welcome. We just we just started, so you haven't missed a thing. Hey Tish from Brisbane. Is it okay to say just give up? Um, I think it's okay to give people permission to give up, yes. I think that's okay. Hey Kathy, welcome. Okay, welcome. I have the, fir the first question I want to answer. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Hospice Nurse Julie. In case you don't know, I go live at 5 on YouTube every Wednesday, uh, Pacific Standard Time. So someone asked, can you tell me more about the end-of-life, um, basically like the end-of-life medication process that's, that's in California? It's also in 10 other states. It's the death with dignity law, where if you meet criteria, you can take medication to end your own life. So what is the criteria? The criteria is you have to have two different doctors at two different times tell you that you have a terminal illness with less than six months to live. You also have to have those two doctors tell you that they have to be willing to participate in the program and they have to be willing to say, yes, you are fully alert and oriented and able to take the medication on your own. Once you get one doctor to do it, then you have to get a second doctor to be able to say that to you. In California, it's two weeks. Two weeks later, you have to get a second doctor to say the same thing, and then you can get the medication. You do all of this before you go on hospice because hospice will not pay for that medication, and it can be expensive. How to find those doctors can be difficult. Some organizations, UCLA, USC, Kaiser, Cedar cyanide. Some hospitals choose to partake in this, so you just have to ask them, and then they will usually have a whole program. So I'm in Los Angeles, that's why I named all the Los Angeles hospitals, but you know, it depends on where you are in California. So, um, some hospitals, you know, like St. John's, will not be a part of it, right? Because they're like a Catholic organization, so it just depends. So, it can be difficult to find those doctors once you find those doctors. You, um, have to go through the whole process and it can take a while. That's why if you know you want to do it, you kind of have to get started, but you can't get started too early because you have to have less than six months to live. So it's tough. It's hard. And some diseases like dementia, by the time you get to a place where you have six months or less to live, you're no longer alert and oriented. So you can't actually get the medication. So certain medications that are terminal still don't meet criteria, unfortunately. I don't believe there's a hotline, Ruth, but I would say if you can Google, I mean, Ruth, if you're on YouTube, that means you can work a computer. <laughs> so I would Google death with dignity law in California support or something like that, or in Sacramento support. Thank you, everyone who's here. I wanted to start the live with these cards that I like. They're called big talk cards instead of small talk. We have big talk. 
you can find these. these. These are, these are, this is not paid. This is like just my friend and I like doing it. So I thought I'm going to pick a card and I'm going to answer it. And then you guys can also answer it if you want to in the chat. So instead of small talk, we're going to skip the small talk. We're going to get to the big talk. I'm just going to do one. I'm actually, I'm not going to, I'm not going to look and I'll answer. And then we'll keep talking about questions. And if anyone is seeing questions that they can answer in the chat, please feel free to talk amongst yourself. Okay, so I have a big top card. What makes you feel fresh and lively? Okay. What makes you feel fresh and lively? It depends on the day. But sometimes when I wake up in my bed, and I feel so cozy and warm and it feels like, and I'm in no pain because a lot of you guys know I get chronic pain kind of in my neck and jaw and stuff. So I can wake up kind of like, uh. but when I don't wake up like that, I just wake up like perfectly still and warm and like I slept really well. I love that feeling. It's so funny. That does make me feel fresh and lively, even though it's like the morning. But another thing is when there's like a certain smell in the air when it's kind of like brisky and you're outside and you're walking with trees and stuff. Ooh, that can make me feel brisk and lively. And the other thing is when I go into the Pacific Ocean, because Pacific Ocean is so cold, even in the summertime, that can make me feel brisk and lively. A lot of people are saying hot showers, hot showers, coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, don't you love these? They have a little mini thing called Big Talk and then a big thing called Big Talk. Makes me so happy. They're so fun. Rich and I play together all, all the time. Does anyone else go to bed like excited to wake up to drink coffee or is that just the addict in me? <laughs> Art makes you feel lively. Oh, that's amazing. Kidney failure with liver failure, should he be discharged on palliative or hospice? Um, if you want, if there's any kind of treatment this person can still get, if they can get dialysis, if they're looking for a transplant, they should be on palliative. If someone's saying they can't do dialysis and they can't get a transplant and that's like, this is kind of the end, they think they have six months left to live, they should do hospice. So you should ask the doctor to be straight with you about that. A lot of people who, ooh, they love smelling coffee grounds at night, the night before. Yes. Having the curing all set up the night before. Amen. Yes. Hey, Julie, hope you're having a great day. Is there any, any media like a show, movie, or book that you think does a good job at showing hospice? Definitely not a show or media. No, <laughs> no movie or TV show. They do no one does a good job. I have not seen, there is one show called, um, oh, what's it called? I actually quote it in my book, Scrap, uh, scratched from scratch, maybe from scratch. They do a good job at hospital and hospice for the most part, but everything else, no. Um, my book, but it's not a fictional book. You know, it's a nonfiction book. So my, you know, my book right here will, will really do a good job, but it's not, uh, it's not like a fictional show. No show really does a good job. Can someone be lucid when they die in hospice? Elizabeth. Yes, they can. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. I have specific circumstances in my friend, like my friend's grandma, you know, my friend, Jenny, who's my best friend will always say, I love watching her videos. And I got to say, my grandma didn't die at all the way you say most people die. She was talking right up until the last moment of her breath and she, last like her last breaths. And she was like alert and oriented. That doesn't happen that much, but that does happen. So yes, people can be alert. Hi, Julie. I'm on my journey towards maid service. My hospice nurse is great fans of yours from Canada. Oh, Jackie. Thank you. And thank you for, um, thank you for sharing. Yeah, Abigail. Yeah. Hadley's new show is going to be great. However, I, do, I could be wrong, but I do think she sold, I could be wrong, but I think she sold her book, right? Her book rights. So it's probably going to be like her book, which is great. Her book is amazing. Um, 
it'll be interesting to see because I think she's going to be obviously having some say in how it looks. So it'll be cool to see um, how television will choose to make it, right? Like, are they going to make it like, because her book is really warm and fuzzy because she had a bunch of warm and fuzzy moments, which is amazing. And it's it'll be curious to see how TV does it, how they'll be able to make it real or not real, you know? Because sometimes television will just, just for entertainment purposes, will like make things more entertaining -y, right, than real. Oh, thank you, Doc K. I'm going to, um, I hope it's okay if I read out loud. Hi, my dad recently passed. I finally got the nurse to give him pain meds. He fell asleep with his eyes open. He died later that night. I'm haunted. I didn't say I love you. I was just in decisions mode. Yeah, that's, that is, that is how it goes sometimes. I think that's half, a lot of the reason why I'm here is to try to help people you know, it's not your fault. You know, it's not your fault. You don't know what you don't know. You know what I mean? Um, but the more we can kind of prepare, even when we think it's not happening, the more we can be prepared when it does start happening. And just FYI, you said when he, he fell asleep with his eyes open, that's very, very normal. And to be expected, most people who die, die with their eyes open. And it's not because they're actually awake. Um, it's just because it takes a lot of muscles to close the eyes. So they're actually like fully unconscious, but their eyes are open because it takes a lot of muscles to close the eyes. So it is very normal. I'm so sorry you feel haunted. I'm so sorry you feel haunted. This is a this is a place where I like to let people feel how they feel, even if it feels bad. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to try to take away that feeling because I want to validate that it's really normal to feel like that. It sucks. <laughs> for lack of a better word, it sucks to feel like that, but it's normal to feel like that. And I think that's half the reason why so many people are drawn to my channel because they want to understand why. Um, and I do think Doc K, my channel will help you at least understand, you know, um, at least understand and hopefully take some of that away. I do think you feel haunted now. I do think over time, especially if you explore and learn about things and like feel all the things you got to feel. I do think over time it may turn less haunting, hopefully, hopefully. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, Doc K for the question. Thank you, Elizabeth. Did you have anything you wanted to ask me or are you just being nice and giving me money? <laughs> thank you. Thank you to everybody. I'm reading all the comments. Um, so if, if you're saying things like you've helped me so much or thank you or I really like following you, I'm reading all of those things and thank you. I just don't read every single one out loud because um, I just want to make sure I get to as many questions as I can. But I really appreciate everybody who's saying that. Thank you so much. And just so you know, I, I do love and try to create a community here. So please talk amongst yourselves. There are many people who come here week after week after week. So if you need a support group and you need to be with the group that's here consistently, we are here consistently every Wednesday, 5 p.m. It is free. So please come and join us. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. You wanted to be kind, but you did. Oh, thank you. You're so sweet. Thank you, everyone. I'm just reading through the stuff here. And if and if I didn't answer anything that you need me answered, please just keep writing it and then write it in all caps too, if you want. That'll help. The gift, the best gift my parents ever gave me was setting up a trust. Please consider if you have children. Yes. The best thing you could ever do for your children is to set up a trust. Even if you think I've got nothing to put in a trust, I think people consider trust like for only wealthy people. Not true. Basically, like any assets you should put into a trust. House. I think you can put a house into a trust. I don't know. You know what I was thinking about doing is once a week or maybe even once a month having like one expert, like a like um, like a lawyer come on and explain how to actually do the trust thing. Because I can kind of talk about it. And actually, it's in my book. 
but um, I can't just like rattle off a bunch of facts, but, but having all of your things in a trust is, is key. Miss S C S Craig COPD and congestive heart failure have been on hospice a month, air hunger about to start morphine. You have helped my journey so much. God bless you. Oh, Yes, if you're having, thank you for being here. Thank you for being willing to listen and be here. I think it's really hard to kind of confront it head on, but you are. And I really feel like morphine will really help you. So I'm glad you're starting morphine for the air hunger. Um, there are other things you can do. I'm just itching my thigh. <laughs> I just realized how that looked on camera. <laughs> but um Morphine will help you so much with the air hunger. It's going to relax your diaphragm, relax your central nervous system, and kind of give you that like ah, feeling. Other things. Now, this is just general. I'm not giving you medical advice. There's other things you can do. Not you, but anyone with COPD or congestive heart failure. A lot of times with COPD, you may already be on steroids. So steroids can help. Um, nebulizers can help. Oxygen can help, obviously. Um, steroids are like my favorite for COPD. Yes, there was a video where someone filmed their father's last moments. He kind of stiffened up and sneezed his last breath. Is that a typical last breath? I would not say it's typical to sneeze. Um, I wonder if that's one that I made because I just made another one where someone sneezed too. But I will say that's not really, that's not super typical to sneeze. No, but there's a lot of things going on up here. There's congestion, your sinuses can be acting up like we're straight. You have oxygen sometimes. So things can be going on. And a sneeze is basically your body's way of getting stuff out, getting um, different dust particles or something out of the nose. So it's not bad, but I wouldn't say it's normal. Or not normal. I'm sorry. It's not bad, but I wouldn't like. I wouldn't say it's weird. Um, but I wouldn't say it's typical. How about that? It's not typical. Hi, Catherine. Nice to see you. Um. Uh, okay. Let's see, Kayla. When my dad came home from the hospital and my mom and dad or, and my mom and dad was told he was all set for hospice. When he got home, he was literally told he had to give up in order to go on hospice. Kayla. That tells me your hospice nurse or hospice, like people who we were talking to did not do a good job explaining hospice. So I really like to get rid of this idea of like fighting cancer and like you fight and fight and fight and then you give up or whatever. Cancer, kidney disease, heart disease. It's not that. You're not giving up. There is only so much you can do in certain circumstances. It's not like... Like we have had many advances in our medical in the medical field to help people live longer, right? But eventually those things start making things worse instead of helping, especially chemo. Chemo can help with side effects. And then they get to a place where they're actually not helping. They're actually could cause people to die quicker or being super aggressive with different cardiac medications could cause people to die quicker. Making people be on dialysis for kidney disease if their body can't handle it can make them die quicker. So it's not about giving up. It's about deciding what you, you're going to like, here's the deal is like, there's going to be a time in everyone's life, depending on how they die, that it's like, you're going to die. You're going to. Now, how do you want that to look? Do you want to be at home with your family? Like you're going to die in six months, whether you fight or get like that or give up or not. I mean, that's why the wording is so awful. It's more like you're going to die. Which one do you want? Do you want to be at home with family or do you not? Or do you want to be at hospital trying to do a bunch of things that are probably, it's probably going to make you sick. Um, and I hope I don't sound too insensitive. I'm not trying to be, I'm trying to be like, people should have talked, should have spoken to you differently um, about what was going on. And again, I don't actually know what was exactly happening with your dad, but in general, I feel like people 
people in the healthcare field don't know how to talk to people about what's actually going on to help people understand. And it does a real disservice because then all people hear is, so I'm just supposed to give up? It's like, no, that's not, that's not the case. It's like, if there's nothing more to do, or any of us, any of us here, right? 251 of us here. If someone told us for sure you're going to be dead in six months, what would you want to do? How would you want to live? We would, we would, our life, some of our lives would change. So I think we do a disservice in the medical field because we don't always do that. We're not always that clear. There's not always treatment answers to make us live longer. In fact, most people on hospice live longer than their counterparts who decide not to do hospice. So people always associate hospice with you're just dying and that's it. And really, it's like you could have a terminal disease and be treating it and you're going to die and that's it too. But on hospice, you can actually live longer because you're not always taking these treatments that are really hurting you. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but I hope that I hope that made a little bit of sense. And I'm really sorry that someone talked to your family like that. <laughs> Doc K, I just saw I just saw um, your comment here. Oh, the ranting cabbie. I'm glad you're here. Grace, gosh, that's not the way it was explained to me. My mom is in palliative care now. Next step is hospice, which is not giving up. It opens the door for more assistance. Exactly, yeah. Um, Eric says, I try to talk to my mom about funeral services after she got diagnosed with CHF. She doesn't want to talk about it. How can I get her last wishes so we can be prepared. Um, you can always give her some space because we can't force anybody, but also you can openly talk about what you want if you want to die, <laughs> like if you're going to die, what you want. So I always start off being like, well, what I would want, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, we don't want to talk about blah, blah, blah. Okay. And I go, okay, okay. Well, I just want you to know in case anything happens to me, this is what I want. I think it's really important that I prepare myself. So if something were to happen to me, everything is prepared for you. And then, okay, give them a beat, right? And you can either leave it at that and then go along your day and go along your time, maybe a week or two later, mention it again. Or sometimes that'll open it up to be like, well, fine. Then if I have to do da, 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 this is what I want to. Sometimes, sometimes we can't force people to do it. Or if you want to, if your mom is on palliative or hospice, which I don't think she is yet, but if she is, you can also ask them to talk to her about it. You can do a family meeting. Someone just asked me to explain the difference between hospice and palliative care because it's a really long winded question that I get all the time. Could you, I always tell you to go to my hospice search, Julie YouTube and look for my video. It's, it'll be under the videos and just look for hospice and hospice first. I'm constantly burping on my lies because I constantly drink Topo Chico. Um, but I'll be on, it'll be under hospice versus palliative care. There's a whole like 14 minute video and it'll give you all the details. Welcome everyone. I'm hospice nurse, Julie, in case you don't know me yet, I try to answer all your death and dying questions, hospice questions, palliative care questions. If you really want something answered and I'm not seeing your stuff, make sure you just put it in all caps. I'll do my best. I'm here every Wednesday, live at five. This is my new book that is out for pre-order now. Nothing to fear, demystifying death to live more fully. You can find it at hospicenursejulie.com. And basically, it's on sale anywhere. So wherever you get your books. Oh, Carl, I'm so glad you're here because I really want to answer this question. And then Rob and I see yours in all caps. I will try to get to it. 
So Carl says, I watched my dad die of COPD. It seems like they gave him a lot of drugs to keep him in bed. He kept trying to get up. It was horrible to watch and seemed like they gave, it seems like I gave someone permission to OD him. So very common fear, misconception, and like a guilt thing people carry around. So definitely not. On hospice, we do need, to, I can see how you'd see, feel, see that, right? But the main thing is keeping someone comfortable, right? That's the whole thing on hospice. So if someone is at the end of life and they are not comfortable, which someone continuously getting out of bed is called, usually called terminal agitation. It can happen a lot in people who are really independent, people who are really like not used to sitting still or lying down or having anyone care for them. I don't know what your dad was like, but it, it can happen for many reasons. Low oxygen, which also he would have with COPD. But a lot of times personality comes into play too. So if someone cannot, if, we'll, if they keep trying to get out of bed, we have to keep them safe because they can't get out of bed. Because physically, they physically cannot get out of bed and they're going to have a fall and they're going to break a hip and all these different things, right? So we have to keep them safe. And it's sometimes we can give them enough medication to kind of like chill them out for a little bit. And then they wake up and they're like a little more chill. And then we don't have to keep giving medications. But sometimes it's like, nope, they're either getting, getting medications and asleep and calm or awake and not asleep and calm. And we have to keep we have to basically kind of like keep them sedated so they don't hurt themselves. And so they can actually pass comfortably, but that can be really hard to watch, especially if you don't understand what's going on um, or not understand, but you know, you're looking at it one way. And in reality, I think the main thing is to keep someone comfortable and everyone's comfortability varies. And really the amount of medication we give people even though it seems like a lot, the amount we're actually giving is pretty small. That's why we can give so much. And the body's shutting down, so it doesn't even absorb half the stuff that we're giving it. So it's like, it's getting, like, how much are they really getting? Um, I hope that makes sense. You did not OD him. And thank you for allowing them to keep your dad as comfortable as possible. I'm taking care of my 80-year-old alcoholic. Home health dropped him because he wouldn't quit drinking. Mm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Home health can do that. Home hospice does not, does not do that, but they have, but the, but the, but the person has to be terminal. So if he has end stage liver disease from being an alcoholic, um, he could be on hospice and he could still keep drinking, but it's going to be hard on you. It's going to be hard on you. I'm so sorry. Can I get the ebook? Yes, you can get the ebook. It's not available till June, but I'm always having everyone pre order. Hey, Funky Fern. I always learn something from you. Thank you. My friend died after his first chemo treatment. Can you speak on that? It was stage three. So it's real. Tina, thank you so much for being here. It's really hard for me to speak on that because. I'm not an oncology nurse, so I don't really, I'm not really around chemotherapy that much. I was an ICU nurse for many years, which is different than oncology. And then I was a hospice nurse. Um, so it'd be hard for me to know sometimes different chemos and stuff, the side effects, like you could get a pulmonary embolism and like that can kill you really quick and really fast. And it's, it's not really normal for that to happen. So sometimes side effects of certain things can, um, cause you to die quicker than most people would with that disease. So I wonder if that was something to, if that had something to do with it. Hi, Ashley Cook. Welcome to the Compassionate Companions. Thank you for being a member. Thank you for everyone who pre-ordered my book. I see that. I often write in caps because I have a brain injury and dementia. So caps help my brain process what I'm seeing. Thank you. <laughs> Phoenix, Angel Heart. I feel like that's, it's easier for me to read everything when it's in caps too. What are your thoughts on long-term care, such as Jimmy Carter being on hospice for a year? Oh, Phoenix Angel Heart. It's the same, you're the same person that just read your other thing. Um, I think it's great. I think um, Medicare really has um, uh, hammered down on hospice companies that were committing Medicare fraud by allowing people to who are not terminal to be on hospice. 
That's why hospice companies are so highly regulated because when it was first started, anyone could open a hospice company. So everyone did. And they basically just took a bunch of money from the government without trying to, without showing them what was happening <laughs> and what they were doing with the money. So then Medicare was like, I don't think so. And then they buckled down. Um, not that I'm like, whatever, I don't need to get political, but, um, but I, so I do like that. I, I know that a lot of that can't, the Medicare fraud stuff can't really happen that much anymore. And someone like Jimmy Carter, come on now. He deserves to be on hospice as long as he wants, but they're probably doing a good job at like showing that he, that he can be on hospice. Basically we, you have to prove to the government that someone has declined enough since the last recertification that they can continue to be on hospice. So you get six months. At the end of six months, we reevaluate. Do they still have technically six months to live? Are they showing decline? Do they show that they still need this? If the answer is yes, they can stay on for another two months. Then at the end of that two months, you have to keep recertifying, re-asking those same questions. Eventually, if we can no longer prove to Medicare that this person has been declining since they signed up, we have to take them off service. So eventually, if they cannot prove, like if they prove that Jimmy Carter is stable and he is not dying, they may take him off hospice because they have to legally. My dad wanted everyone with him when he died. My mom was the opposite. She chain stoked grief for three days. Yeah, some people can really hang on for a while. Or not. It really depends on the personality. Was I always comfortable with death? Kind of. <laughs> I think I kind of was like a little bit of a weirdo since I've been little. Um, I've always been somewhat like interested in death and the afterlife. And like what happens? Why are we here? I've always been a very existential person. Even as a little kid, I was asking questions like, Hey, Precious. I just saw Precious that, hey, Julie, I hope you're still here. Uh, when I was little, I would used to ask my mom questions like, why are we here? What's this all about? What happens when we die? Um, of course, like my parents are not like that at all. So <laughs> I had two parents being like, what the hell? <laughs> why is our little kid asking us this? Oh, uh, funky fern. My mom has been experiencing terminal agitation. It's hard. She's fallen three times in the last 24 hours. She's now prescribed Valium and some other anxiety meds. I know it is so hard. Terminal agitation, it does not happen with everybody. Everyone on here, not everyone gets terminal agitation, but a lot of people do. And sometimes it's because of the disease and sometimes it's because of personality. Uh, sometimes it's both. It's hard to know. Uh, thank you, Laura. Hi, Julie. I'm on hospice for end-stage renal disease. I worry about recertification every time it comes up, but so far qualified each time. I would be lost without hospice nurses. I know. It's so hard. Lori, please know if you ever do get taken off, you can still call the Medicare number and they can take 48 hours to look through all your charts and they'll either agree with the hospice company and say, yes, you need to come off hospice or they'll say, no, we think you can stay on and then you can stay on. So no, they'll explain all that to you. So know your rights, but you know, it can be hard after a while you might have to come off, which sounds crazy. Oh, Phoenix Angel Heart, you're such a sweetie. Do you think you're an empath? You know, it's like I vacillate between how much I, it's not that I don't believe in that, but it's like, how much do I want to like dig into that or not? You know, if I, if I fully believe in it, then like totally, yes, <laughs> I'm an empath for sure. <laughs> but part of me just wants to be like, wants to like ignore that, I guess, because I also could just have like social anxiety and need to like set better boundaries or whatever, you know? Um, I just know that I don't know, but if whenever I like read about like someone who's highly sensitive or who's empathic, I mean, I definitely relate to it. I also relate to being, um, Claire audience, maybe like the thing where you like get messages in your head from like 
an unknowing space. <laughs> I think it's called Claire Audient. I think. Yeah. Which I don't really talk about that <laughs> now that I just did. Because I don't because I don't know enough about it and it doesn't happen all the time, right? So it's like why why uh talk about it. It's like all of a sudden it just sort of happens and then it doesn't. So someone um, someone just wrote, can you please tell me more about end stage heart failure? So I have all my videos on YouTube and several of them are what to expect when. And those are the type of videos you want to look for. What to expect with CHF, which is heart failure. What to expect with renal failure, what to expect with lung disease, lung cancer, colon cancer. I have many videos all like that. So if any of your questions are about that, um, go to my page and look for that video because it'll be like a 10 minute video about the whole thing. What can we expect for end stage CHF? Yes, Michelle. So there's there's a what to expect with end stage CHF and what to expect with with, with end stage kidney disease CKD. I have two different videos about that. I would go into it now, but the videos are so much better. <laughs> they have like super detail. They're like you know four minutes long, six minutes long, eight minutes long, whatever, and they'll be labeled just that. What to expect with CHF. Welcome everyone. Come on in. 318 of you guys here. Amazing. Thank you so much for all being here. And thank you for all the members that are here to the membership program. My book is out for pre-order. You can get it basically anywhere. That's the title. That's my name. End stage MS, Gina. I actually don't see end stage MS very often. For whatever reason, they don't come on hospice. I don't know why. Oh, Michelle, I would say it's not different. So Michelle said, I didn't know if it was different with all three combined. So Michelle, it depends on what they're coming on hospice for. So it depends on what's more prevalent. Is this is the kidney disease end stage and they stop dialysis? That death is that will be the pro, that will be the prominent thing in the the way they're going to die, which is usually very, very gentle and quiet. And like they basically just fall asleep and then they die. But it is quick. Usually about seven days if they stop peeing. CHF, congestive heart failure, if that's the main issue, those people can linger a really long time. Meaning like they can live a long time with CHF. So it depends on which is more severe. Um, organ donation cannot really happen on hospice, Phoenix. Not just mine. It'll be seven years next month that I lost my 25 year old, 24 year old son. I have since learned my five remaining children need to be prepared for the reality of death, not just mine. Please speak to organ donation. Well, you're either an organ donor or you're not. And on hospice, unfortunately, you cannot be an organ donor unless you donate your whole body to science. Or you can also sometimes donate your corneas and sometimes donate your brain to science. But like I am an organ donor. So if I died in a car accident, um, they would take my organs, hopefully, and give them to people. I'm not sure if that's what you mean, but um, that's what I can speak to. Why did my dad, Louis body's dementia get worse after surgery? I would talk to his specific dementia doctor. I'll speak to it a little bit, but please know that like, I'm no, I'm not an expert in Louis body dementia. I am at end of life, but not after surgery, but I do just in general 
kind of know some things. So, but I would speak to their doctor. In general, surgery for anyone elderly or anyone with dementia. So anyone elderly, surgery can be hard. Anyone elderly with cognitive issues like Lewy body dementia, there's something with anesthesia that just does not bode well. I don't know why, but I know it's common. So having surgery when you have dementia is, is, is not the greatest. It can make things worse. Sometimes they get worse and then they kind of bounce back, right? So it's hard to really know, but I would specifically talk to the doctor and see um, if that's really a thing. You know, like it might not actually be a thing, but it is something that I kind of hear about a lot, but I don't know any scientific reason behind it because I don't know that part about, I don't know that part of dementia that well. I'm more of like an end of life person with dementia versus like the whole long process of dementia. Is 93 over 57 a near death blood pressure? No. No. And if someone is near death, don't worry about their blood pressure because it doesn't matter. It seriously doesn't. The blood pressure, all the vitals are all going to fluctuate. It's not going to matter. They're not even going to pick up that great. So I would not focus on the numbers. Um, but no, it's not. I'm an undergrad student and I want to work in hospice. Any advice on grad school, gaining experience or getting into the field? Caitlin, you do not need grad school if you're undergrad for a nurse. So you have to be a nurse <laughs> or if you don't want to be a nurse, a social worker. So then getting your MSW. Um, but if you are an undergrad for nursing, you don't need to get your master's. But if you wanted to get your master's in nursing, I would get your NP instead and then be a nurse practitioner in hospice. And you are going to learn all your experience on the job. So don't focus too much about school. I was like that too, where I was more like, I'm just going to do tons of schooling to try to prepare. I would say don't do that and just go into the field. That's what I would do. Because that's where you're going to learn. I had palliative care for my dad and hospice was also involved. Is that normal? No, it's not normal. Normally you have one or the other. I'm surprised they allowed that. My dad is sleeping about 22 hours a day. I think he's going to die. He's 84, 12 years ago, had a massive stroke. You know, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. Um, I don't know if he's on hospice already. I can't give medical advice, unfortunately, here. But 22 hours a day is a, is, is a lot. So it probably means he's not eating too. 84 is old ish, right? I don't mean to, I don't mean to be like, so it doesn't matter now. It still matters, but I just, you know, some people, um, to me, I feel like once someone's in their mid eighties, it's kind of like, to me, it's better to kind of let the body be the guide. Um, but don't just listen to a nurse on the internet, <laughs> take him to the doctor if he hasn't seen one. Right. We do take vitals on hospice, but personally, I don't care about vitals on hospice. When I was an ICU nurse, that's all we cared about. But personally, the only, th I always care about how someone looks. If I'm looking at them and they are telling me they have air hunger, but I take their oxygen level and it's normal. I'm not going to go, well, your oxygen level is okay. I'm going to go, okay, let's treat your air hunger. Let's give you some oxygen, maybe give you some morphine. Let's see if that helps. I'm not going to care what the number is. But if someone's number is 88% on oxygen or on the um, oximeter, but they feel fine, I'm not going to be worried about the low oxygen because they feel fine and they look fine, right? So, yeah. Is it normal for the hospice nurse to check the blood pressure on the wrist instead of using a stethoscope to determine death? Interesting. <laughs> this happened to my husband. I thought it was weird. 
I mean, I never did that. I never do. I never do that. But uh, technically, someone could. They could press that thing, and then nothing comes up. So it should be zero zero zero. Um, so yeah, they could do that. I have never done that, but they could. Which meditation video were you listening to the ladybug thing? Okay, so Ralph is talking about my ladybug story where I did a meditation and like ladybugs landed on me. Unfortunately, Ralph, you're going to have to go back to my page and, oh, thanks, Ralph, and look for the ladybug video. It's down, 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 down. But you'll see it because it'll be like ladybugs and stuff. And then in the description of that video, so you have to know how to find that. You will find the link to that meditation. I hope that helps. I'm sorry, Brenda. I can't answer. Uh, not Brenda. Sorry. I'm sorry, David C. I can't answer your question because that's a little like giving me medical advice. I don't know enough about that medication anyway to really um, tell you that. You can try Googling it, though. Oh, man, I'm sorry, Lori. It sounds like you had a rough weekend. Have you witnessed animal grief while owners are passing? Paco. Yes. Yes, I have. Animals do all types of crazy stuff. I've seen animals take on the symptoms of their owners dying. I've seen them like refuse to eat, refuse to go on walks while their loved one was like actively dying. I've seen them guard their loved one, lay with their loved one until they died. Um, so I guess I would consider that grief. Yeah. Yeah. Can hospice use pain meds other than morphine? Yes, they can, Kathy. We have tons of other things we can use besides morphine. Is it normal for people to cry tears after death? Is it normal for people to cry tears after death? So we don't, personally, you know, I always feel bad saying this because I think some people hold on to the fact that their loved one maybe had a tear going down their face or something. And I don't want to take that away from them. So I'm saying all of that you know, when I say all that is because I don't, we don't per, like most healthcare workers don't think it's actual, they are tears, but it's not for emotion. It's like biological because the eyes are usually doing funky things. They're not blinking or they're open or they're, they've just been like, they're not fully engaged and the eyes are putting moisture and different things over the eyes to protect the eyes, which I think causes tears. So that's why, that's why we think people are doing that, um, not because of emotional reasons. Tina, what to expect from a person with stage four liver failure? Tina, thank you for that question. And I'm going to have you go to my actual YouTube page because there's a whole beautiful bitty, uh, bitty. <laughs> there's a whole beautiful video about that. And it's going to be labeled what to expect with either end stage liver disease or like what to expect with liver cancer. Either way, it'll, that's what you're looking for. End stage liver disease. It'll be on there. It will be on there. How easy, um, hi Julie, how easy is it to be able to get into hospice home instead of dying at home if only insurance, Medicare? So Michelle, it's going to depend on your state and what's in your area. So what she's saying is a lot of people go on to hospice in their home. And when they go on hospice in their home, their family has to take care of them, like basically fully take care of them. Most of the family, all the work falls on the family. If you go into like a hospice home or like an inpatient hospice where you're going to live somewhere until you die, one that can be expensive and 
Two, it depends on the hospice and, and what state you're living in. So like some hospice companies are like in patient hospice homes and that's the company. So it's like you're there and it comes with, it, it, you don't have to pay for it. Some places you have to pay for. Um, some places, some insurance, some Medicare, some Medicaid will pay for it. Some don't. So it can be really, really complicated and there's not always an easy answer. So for instance, in California, we don't really, at least in Los Angeles, we don't really have hospice homes. So people who don't have money or even like just average people who don't have extra money, right. But they have insurance and stuff have a hard time finding placement for their loved one if they can't take care of them at home on hospice. And then as you know, Medicare and Medicaid, um, they have like free places, like free nursing facilities people can go to, but they're like few and far between. And if you can get into those, then hospice companies can come see you there. Um, but it can be, it can be difficult, but some states are better than others with having like my, my best friend, her dad was in a hospice home, a hospice care center. And it was just like being on hospice. It was through the hospice company. Um, so it was good, but not every, not every, um, state or city is like that. Christina says, my uncle died from glioblastoma. They gave him a fentanyl patch and he passed the next day. Do you think the patch helped him pass peacefully? I, um, no, I don't think so. I think the patch probably helped, but I don't think it made him die or pass away sooner for sure. Uh, one, because the fentanyl patch, the full, once it was, once it's placed, the full amount of like, fentanyl that's going to be going through it's changed every 72 hours so it's not even fully in your system until two or three days so it would have taken two or three days for it to be fully into a system and then he would hopefully get some relief from that um it probably helped a little bit just to relax him a bit but definitely didn't like hasten or quicken his death if that's what you're asking um, but I, it sounds like he died peacefully, which makes me feel happy. He probably was on some other medications too, um, to help him die peacefully. And sometimes people, like I always say, you know, death it, itself is not painful. The dying process is not painful. Diseases you're dying from can be, and they can cause symptoms, but, um, I'm glad he sounds like he had a peaceful death. How long does it take to die? I'm going to use that word instead of pass, just so we all get used to it. How long does it take to die once one has stopped eating and drinking fluids? So fully stopped eating and drinking fluids, usually seven to 10 days. Everyone's different. Sometimes they last longer. Sometimes they don't, but seven to 10 days. Um, is the death gurgle secular rather than old people or is it so the death rattle or death gurgle happens to almost everyone at the end of life no matter what the age so the common denominator is is actively dying the very last stage of, of life and it's usually when someone's dying a natural death, meaning they're on hospice or we know they're dying. So we're kind of letting the natural process take over when you see the death rattle. Sometimes in the ICU, you can because they're really fluid overloaded in the ICU. Um, but most of the time when they're on hospice, like dying a natural death, that's when we see it most because we're letting the natural body, uh, body processes of death take over. And it's not painful. It's not harmful. It's very normal. Uh, if a healthiest person, if a healthy-ish person who stops eating and drinking, will they die in seven to 10 days? No. If you're super healthy, I mean, 
So there are people who have like chronic pain or cro um, like a chronic illness or like a terminal illness that's lasting too long. Some people will decide to do the said, which is like voluntary stop stopping eating and drinking. Um, I've never seen that nurse Penny has hospice nurse Penny. If you guys um, follow her, she's on YouTube too. She's great. We're friends. Um, she's on all social media platforms, but she has witnessed this. And basically people voluntarily stop eating and drinking so they can die. And it can take longer, especially if you are not really close to death. Um, so it can take three, four weeks. And I guess it's not really painful. I guess the first few days can be painful because of this hunger and thirst pains. But after that, it can, um, it's, it's uh, not that bad. I put that in quotes because it sounds bad for me to say it. Welcome everyone. By the way, I'm hospice nurse Julie, in case you're new. I am here every Wednesday live at five. Oh my gosh, we only have three more minutes. Holy crap, this, this hour went quick. And I can't stay longer than an hour because I have a meeting after this at 6.30. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming. Okay, so listen, I am here every Wednesday live at five. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. If I didn't answer your question, please look back through my videos to see if it's there. There are more videos coming out, two or three every week. I think it's going to be two this month every week. My book is out for pre-order, Nothing to Fear, Demystifying Death to Live More Fully. You can find it at hospicenursejulie.com. And then once you click there on the website, you'll see everywhere where it's selling. And it comes in paperback, hard copy, audiobook, which is going to be my voice, and like Kindle or like ebook. And um, I'm going to be announcing the pre-order prize. So anyone who has pre-ordered already or is going to pre-order, you're going to be getting a gift with it. I just can't tell you what it is yet, but you will like it. And it was my idea. Um, okay. Good night, everyone. I have to go. I only have two minutes left, but um, Thank you for joining me. Thank you for all my members to uh, all my members that, and I think we had one new member join today. Um, thank you for that. And thank you for having this wonderful community and everyone talking to each other. You guys are just so great. I really appreciate it. I love you guys. All right. Au revoir. Mon ami. <laughs> Very poorly spoken French. <laughs> thank you everybody. Bye.